welcome to the deep end. I am Red Hawk and my cohorts and co-hosts, Marianne Ruddis coming from Spokane Valley and Bob Hayes all the way from Florida. You know, one of the things, uh, when I was young, you could blow shit up. You can't do that anymore. Matter of fact, you can't even really talk about it. I hope I don't get in trouble for, for saying that. But my brother and I, we used to, you know, at the, the back of Popular Mechanics, you could get all this bomb-making stuff, uh, underwater fuse, casings, all kinds of stuff. So we got into it, man. We were blowing stuff up all over the place. And, of course, my parents were worried about we're going to lose a finger or this or that. And one day, my brother in this time got brought home by the police because he and some friends got a hold of some blasting caps and they realized they could put them in the creek and blow them up underwater. Well, the cops did not like that. So they brought them home. Believe me, they wouldn't bring them home today. They'd be called terrorists or something. But the cops brought them home, basically told my parents what had gone on and how that whole thing worked. And my the cop left. My mom, you know, hi, hey, boys, boys. And my dad was just, he read my brother the riot act. I mean, this was unacceptable stuff. And finally, my dad said to my brother, so what do you have to say for yourself, Rick? And Rick, without missing a beat and with a straight face said, as God is my witness, I had no idea cops could run that fast. That was funny to me. That was funny. Now, then there's the guy who walks into the bar with a giant frog on his head, and the bartender says, hey, what the heck is that? And the frog says, hey, last week it was just a pimple on my butt. See, there's a twist going on. There is this, this place where uh, the, 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 that intersects on human life. I've become convinced that that life without humor basically equals Donald Trump. Uh, that's a joke, too, by the way, although it's not so funny. So here at the deep end, we're going to take humor seriously. I mean, life is heavy. It's full of what no other creature really has to deal with, which are the, they, they have to deal with the suffering, but not the contradictions and the hypocrisies and the injustice and as humans, this humus, hum, humor piece, it has almost a redemptive loop to it, a reconciling aspect that somehow gives us a release valve, a way to not make it better, but to help us endure and possibly reach for some fresh understandings, a way of play that can create new openings for different ways of thinking about things. It can shift our perspective, humor. It always amazed me that the words humor, human, and humility all have the same root, which is humus, which is of the earth, truly. And think about jokes and sitcoms and romantic comedies. Humor is integral to human life. And, and as many have said, if you can laugh at yourself, you will always be entertained. Now, Aristotle said that Humor is basically stories about people who are worse than us. I, I think about uh, some of the sitcoms I've watched, and it's like, God, these people are so stupid. Well, <laughs> they're, they're representations of things worse than us. Schopenhauer said that humor is the only divine quality in human beings. And Carl Jung, who <laughs> was quite funny. People don't realize he was cracking jokes all the time. And sometimes they didn't go over well, but he didn't care. He, he saw that as an indication of the people he was telling them to. He said that people with no sense of humor are so difficult to treat that if you don't, you might not with humor, you can't really cure. Again, you're not necessarily making things better, but you can keep people afloat. And isn't that what humor does? Humor almost uh, uh, has this quality to it uh, that that is unspoken and we can't really talk about, but is there. The Mayo Clinic and a number of other uh, organizations have done great studies on it. It reduces the level of stress. This is just laughing. 
just laughing. It reduces the level of stress hormones like cortisol, uh, epinephrine, that's adrenaline, dopamine, and growth hormone. It increases the level of health-enhancing hormones like endorphins. It increases the number of antibodies producing cells that we have working for us. It enhances the effectiveness of T cells. In other words, it ups our immune system. It strengthens and boosts our mood, and it can even diminish pain. It's an amazing, you know, we're finding, you know, Reader's Digest used to have a section called Laughter is the Best Medicine. It seems to be able to create this psychological resilience. It, it can reduce uh, anxiety. It's, it almost has this uh, ability to neutralize negative emotions. And again, it does, it's not just about the stress and the deactivating of stress response. We get more ex, uh, oxygen in our system. It's good for our heart. It's, it fosters, again, relaxation. And these are just a few. We could go on to all the implications. Humor, comedy. And I want us to see that, that there is a real relationship to tragedy in this. I don't want to dwell on that, but, but basically what, what, uh, a good comedy can do is take the tragedy of life and at least make it bearable. And the way I've learned to see it is life is a farce. And when you really think about what farce is, it's choreographed confusion. It's just a, an amazing thing. And humor has to do with the reaction to, of incongruity. Like my brother saying, uh, it's, it's, uh, I had no idea cops could run that fast. It was true, but it was out of the whole context of him being scolded that it was just, we all broke out laughing. And my mom didn't like that she laughed, but it was redemptive. You see, human life is humorous life. So, Hyung knew, you know, I, I want to just touch one more thing, and that's the spiritual benefits. Uh, Hyung and Alan Watts both knew this. One of my favorite films of Alan Watts on meditation is at the very end, he's literally in a pond up to his knees uh, of lily pads. And he says, in the end, the best meditation is laughter. And he just bursts out with a belly laugh. And the film basically, you know, goes dark with him laughing. There's something about this. In my view, not just from doing the study, but really trying to talk about this deep side of things, humor helps us become a bit more fluent in the life we are living. It's a full spectrum life and there's very heavy stuff that is going on. How do we do that? I think one of the things, and this is what I'm recommending, we each in, need to up our daily intake of laughter of somehow relating to this, this this farce of life. Human consciousness is a tricky thing, and you can get caught in a lot of little whirlpools and get sucked down into some negative stuff. Ah, there's medicine for that. So, my friends, Bob and Mary Ann, uh, I want to hear what you have to say and also say you got any good jokes. Bob, let's start with you. Okay, I'll, I'll try and be serious to start this. Uh, I think you hit a number of really important points. Uh, of course, anything that Carl Jung had to say, in my mind, uh, touches on important things. Uh, but humor can really be of diagnostic value. If, if a person doesn't understand or doesn't appreciate a good joke, it tells you so much about them. That the something's going on that needs to be uh, addressed in their own being. Um, humor itself is so, there's such a wide variety of different types of humor. Uh, and again, the different varieties can tell you a lot about different kinds of people. Uh, like in general, males find the three stooges funny. Females don't find them so funny. Uh, that's a gross overgeneralization, but I think it's true. Uh, humor ranges from very sophisticated uh, jokes that maybe take five minutes to set up and then a, a quick line at the end to one-liners. I always loved one-liners, so 
I brought a couple of one-liners as my jokes for today. Uh, but before I give you one, uh, I think that if we could get these political debates to be more like roasts, we would learn a lot more about the candidates than we do with these little scripted, very serious questions and answers. If we could tell whether or not they could laugh themselves, we would know how human they really are. Uh, so with that, I'm going to give you a couple of quick one-liners. Um, I am presently experiencing life at a state of several WTFs per hour. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm laughing. I'm just not laughing out loud. <laughs> uh, all right. I'll give you one more. I was going to tell you a, a, a joke about time traveling. But you guys didn't like it. <laughs> I love it. Marianne, what say you? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'll tell you what. I think that um, humor and laughter is, are so necessary um, to be able to navigate this whole world that we live in. Um, because it is... It can be tragic. It can be hurtful. And I, I see humor as this pressure valve. It's a pressure release yeah. valve. And it can immediately um, bring calm um, to really tense situations. And I tried, you know, I used to know jokes. I used to be able to tell jokes. And um, I think I, I would rather just share um one of my favorite stories from being at the hospital. Um, so I used to spend a lot of time on the peds oncology unit with my kids and people would say, Oh my gosh, you know, that's gotta be so sad. And yet we would laugh more there than, than I can tell you. Um, and I remember one time when, uh, well, my daughter used to do this to all the new nurses or all the new docs when they would come in, when she knew somebody new was coming in, um, she would get a specimen um, cup and fill it with apple juice <laughs> and set it on her, her nightstand. And when somebody new came in, she would go, oh, wait a minute, I'm thirsty, and open it up and drink it. And it would just just come set the mood right there. And then um, That's and then pretty damn thinking, good. That's pretty good, I have to admit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, if, if you can't, if you can laugh, in life and death situations, you can, um, it, it makes it so much easier to, to be there for the tough stuff. It yeah. really does. And um, another thing that I wanted to share was um, a story from one of my all time favorite movies um, called Defending Your Life. And it's Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep. And the characters, Daniel and Julia, um, they're in this way station between um, after death and the next place that you go to. And they have to defend their lives. And Julia comes into this, and she had this beautiful, perfect life. And Daniel comes into this, and he was just a mess, right? So they went to the past lives pavilion, and they were able to view their past lives. And, um, and it's funny because Shirley MacLaine opens it up and, and gives a little spiel. But then um, Julia's watching her past life and Daniel's in the next room watching his and she's like King Arthur in another life and um, or Prince Valiant and um, then they're talking to each other and, and she says, oh my God, I think I was Prince Valiant. Who are you? And he's in a jungle being chased by a, a lion and said, I'm dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I found it hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was dinner. And so um, I, I think it's, you know, just the absurdity of some of the situations um, that we find ourselves in. And I'm a big um, proponent of dark humor because it's laughing at what seems to be inappropriate times um, is is a way to cope and it's also a way to connect and i think that's one of the things about humor that um we we find a shared humanity when we can laugh at 
uh, you mentioned the sitcoms earlier. Some of the sitcoms, we're laughing at ourselves. We're laughing at the things that we do that may be exaggerated um, in these um, predicaments. And so, um, I don't know, I think it's integral to um, mental health. I really do. Yeah. And I think that, you know, dark humor, you know, in my study this week, every time I came upon this piece, there's a place where human life seems too real. And that's mm -hmm. where dark humor shows up. And it's almost like learning to dance in the dark. You know, it's like, okay, there's no light, but I'm going to keep dancing. And there's a Job quality to that in my mind uh, that, that, uh, that points to this aspect of human life that we can't, we can point to it. We can't really grasp it, but we can't do life without it. And that's why I said humor helps, you know, it helps us become more fluent in, in life so that those dark places are not uh, more comfortable, but they're no longer strangers. And I think that that's, that's an important piece uh, in this whatever the heck's happening in this great mystery of life and consciousness is how do you live it fully? Uh, and I, as, as Irenaeus said, uh, the true glory of God is a human being fully alive. Uh, and I think that, Bob, you nailed it. I think the first question that should be asked of all the candidates is tell us a joke uh, and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. would be pretty interesting, yeah. Well, you know, satire has been a political tool going back at least five or six hundred years. Uh, going back, I think it was was it William Blake that uh, offered up the the answer to uh, uh, famines. He said, "Well, we just have to eat the children." Oh no, that was uh, Swift. Swift, Jonathan, Jonathan Swift. Swift yes. Yeah, Good. and I mean, so many levels of that are, are just. It just causes your mind to spin off on a, in a million different directions. And uh, uh, I think that's an important. Satire is very important. I also think silliness is very important. I love Monty Python. <laughs> they would take what appeared to be a, a very uh, structured and uh, what everyone else thinks is an important situation, like some kind of a government bureaucracy or something like that, and just turn it on its head, uh, like the Ministry of Funny Walks, where people come in to work at the ministry and they have to demonstrate their funny walk. And it's just, having worked for the government for over 30 years, that, I mean, they, the government itself, any, in any bureaucracy, is so silly at its core yeah. Because of just the, the nature of it. And for them to pull something out like that and just slap the audience in the face with it, I love it. Choreographed confusion. You know, it's interesting. We went to the play uh, uh, that is In Search of the Holy Grail. But what they're really searching for is they want to do a musical. But they can't do a musical until they find a Jew because every musical has a good Jew behind it. And at the end of the play, they find out the guy with the coconuts is a Jew. And they say, well, why didn't you tell us you're a Jew? And he said, well, that's not the kind of thing you'd say to heavily armed Christians. Uh, and I think, you know, the whole play was a setup for that line. And I just yeah. thought, now that is freaking amazing. Amazing. And I want, I don't think we can be fully human without this playful thing. You know, one of the things I really like about America's home videos is the silliness inside of just the average home. Uh, and I think that that's that lightness of heart. You know, and I've shared this story before. I was uh, in an interfaith group, and we were just forming, and it was all fur and brow stuff, and it was my turn to do the opening meditation. And so I told dirty jokes. And uh, everybody laughed but was very uncomfortable and said, Red Hawk, why are you doing this? And I said, look, our work is heavy. How do we keep our hearts light enough that the heaviness doesn't weigh us down? And I think that's part of what humor's role is. And Marianne, as you were talking, your daughter, what she was doing is she was offering redemption 
to everybody, this place in us that is so human that it's it's just amazing. And I don't think any other animals, I've watched some chimpanzees laugh at, at, at not verbal jokes, but at hand jokes and prejudication and stuff like that. Uh, but humans, I don't think we could bear consciousness without this aspect of who we are. This ability to, uh, you know, pull the rug out from under ourselves, to pop our own bubbles, to, um, uh, you know, put a group at ease. Carl Jung used to use humor all the time. You know, when groups would get up tight, he could tell a joke or frame things in such a way that the whole group would laugh. And you, you, he said, you can feel everybody relax. Uh, and I think that that's, there's this role of humor that is easily overlooked and taken for granted. And again, I think we each need to focus on upping our daily intake of, um, of, of laughter. Uh, what did someone call it? Uh, not a laxative, but a laxative, uh, where you keep your system open. Mary Ann? Well, well, I was going to say, I think it's, it's absolutely um, true that it does allow us to be more open. It lowers our resistance to ideas. And I think um, we do tend to take life very, I mean, there are some serious things in life, but when you, when you laugh, when you look at it from the absurdity of it all, um, it does help us to be able to, I don't know, to be able to be more present in the world and um, I was reading something too this week about how um, using laughter and comedy for social change and how important that is becoming. And I think John Stewart really kind of started that. Um, and and the people that are doing that now, they do. They you know John Oliver is is one of my um, favorites. He's <coughs> he's really really good. Um, but. You take some very, very serious, very serious situations and, and structures, like you were talking about with the government, Bob, um, some structures, and you, you highlight them and you, pull, you, you look at them and, and you, can, um, you can persuade people to take it seriously through humor, which sounds like it's um, an oxy oxymoron, but it's not. It's yeah. true. So and I, I think it, yeah. And I think you put your finger on. I mean, as, as you were talking, the things that came to my mind were all in the family. Talk about creating mm -hmm. a contrast, and uh, you know, I don't know if you remember the one with Sammy Davis Jr., uh, but <laughs> talk about dealing with racism face to face, right up front. The Office. Think about, and I'm not a fan of The Office, but my kids are, and I've watched a few of them. The mundane how it can take the mundane and not lift it, but lower it <laughs> to such a degree that it's, it becomes farce. Again, choreographed confusion. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, and I've said the church is a farce, and that's what I'm talking about right there. We, we just are just choreographing this confusion over and over again and, and, and calling it holy. Um, and that's funny to me. That's redemptive. That allows me to find a place in my soul for um, for those pieces that I really don't want to have them in my soul. And I think that that's part of the role of humor is how it it can take us and and create in us new spaces for things to um, for our own inner dialogue, if you will if that makes sense. Um, and we're coming, believe it or not, to the end of our time. So, um, Bob, final comments? Well, you, you've said a lot, so I'll just end with this. Uh, hold on a, just a minute here. I have to overthink this. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love it. I, I, when I was doing my study this week, I was getting all these, you know, my grandson's favorite joke right now is knock, knock. Who's there? Ice cream. Ice cream who? Ice cream because you can't hear me. Um, uh, and I tell him other jokes, but he doesn't get them. Uh, and so I went to adult jokes, and I don't think I'll tell those even to you two, although I told them to my wife and we laughed. Uh, basically, they were dirty jokes, and they were really good. <laughs> so, Marianne, final comments for you? You know, I think that um, this we're living in a world right now with a lot of a lot of tragedy, a lot of challenges. Um, the global warming, the um, the wars, the, uh, the the natural disasters that are happening, um, and people are suffering. And I think that for us to be able to to live with that, we need to balance it. And we'll go back to your word, Bob, balance. Um, we need to balance it with this humor. And we need to, to be able to restore a, um, a, a certain kind of perspective to where um, this, there, there is something else besides the tragedy. And, and humor can bring us there. It can take us to a place of um, respite. I, I guess that would be, it, it's a place of respite. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I wished I was funnier. I do. I wished I, wished I was funnier. I have a good sense of humor. Uh, yeah, but looks aren't everything. Yeah, I want, I want, <laughs> I, I laugh at myself a lot. Um, I want us to understand my final parting thought here is that humor really does give us a release valve, a way to not make things better, but to help us endure and possibly set us up to reach for some fresh understandings. Uh, It's a way of play that can create new openings for different ways of thinking about things. I think that it's it's the ability to um, not just help us reconnect, but to help us recontext, to see our life in a different uh, order of understanding. And I think that that's part of of the, the, the jester role, uh, to pop our bubbles, to get us to become more authentic and real. And Carl Jung really goes into uh, humor and authenticity and how connected those two are. So, uh, you know, my friends, if you're listening to this, uh, uh, I'm at Red Hawk. Uh, the at the deep. Is, what is my email address? I don't know. Uh, but leave me a message and, and just tell me a joke. You know, lighten my day. Um, Red Hawk the Deep End at uh, Gmail dot com. I think that's right. So. Uh, Where do we go from here? Seriously. Well, when you think about what's coming up, it's Thanksgiving. You know, they say that, that, and the Jewish people say that when you get to heaven, there's only one prayer remaining, and that's a prayer of gratitude. The last prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of us being just thankful. What a gratitude, thankful. How do you talk about it? To appreciate the mere opportunity to be alive. I mean, do you know how many sperm swam up that canal and won one and you are it? And it's an amazing thing. This whole universe, the way it is, it's happening. How many trillions upon trillions quintillions of things have to go right in order for you to take one breath. Look around you. Everything is around you started as an idea. If it's not organic, it was an idea and it's come to fruition. Woo! I am so thankful. I hope you are too. And I hope that you're of good humors in the fact that life is a trip and you better have your humor on full volume. Blessings, my friends. Blessings.